hi everyone, my name is Crystal Kodnot and I will be presenting my research affiliated with Emory University on predicting same hospital readmission following Fontan Cable Pulmonary Anastomosis using machine learning techniques. So I have no relevant, um, no relevant relationship with commercial interests that could have affected the results of this study in any way. And after participating in this session, the observer should be able to recognize the background and the problem that Fontan patients face. And my research in this field is critical right now. Understand machine learning applications and visualize the results and interpret them in numerous graphics. And also understand the clinical impl implications of this work. So now on to some background on the disease. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS, is a congenital heart defect that's present in 1,025 babies in the U.S. each year. So there's a mortality rate of 20 to 50% for the high-risk HLHS variants. Fortunately, this number has gone down over the years, thanks to a set of three surgical procedures that most HLHS patients do undergo. The first of which is the Norwood procedure that patients undergo shortly after birth. The second is the bidirectional blend procedure at three to six months. And the third one, which is the one that I'll be looking at in my study, is the Fontan procedure at two to four years. And so what this disease is, is an open heart surgery that redirects blood flow directly into the lungs. So it prevents low oxygen blood from mixing with the high oxygen blood, and this can lead to fatal consequences if not treated immediately. So after, under, after going through a literature review, I found that 49% of Fontan patients required emergency care after undergoing the actual treatment, which meant that in fact, 15% of them had critical life or death encounters. So now on to the data and problem statement of the study that of the data that I'll be using from the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. So the problem is that 40.5% of patients for 137 out of 338 are readmitted after undergoing the content surgery, and the cause is unknown. The condition is fatal without immediate treatment, and it can lead to life-threatening consequences like sepsis. And so the data cohort I'm using was taken from the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta from May 2009 to August 2020. And so the goal of my research is to predict patients at risk of same hospital readmissions following Fontan completion. And this, this would help prevent costly and unnecessary readmissions as well. So now onto the data set, on the features that I'll be uh, feeding into my models. So first are the eight vitals. The vitals that I'm using are the arterial blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, blood pressure, central venous pressure, pulse rate, respiratory rate, uh, oxygen saturation, and body temperature. So each patient had multiple vital readings over their hospitalization stay. So what I did for my study is I used the median vital values on a per patient level. So I fed in eight different vital values in total. Next are the 14 one heart encoding categories of administered medications, and the categories are listed on the slides. So here, instead of worrying about specific dosage levels and the exact type of medication that a patient was given, I was more worried about the overall overarching category of medication that a patient was given, which is why I one hot encoded them with zeros and ones to represent whether a patient had a medication in that category or not. And then comes the 59 laboratory results. The original data set actually had over 200 different laboratory tests, but after consulting with the surgeon, I used the 59 uh, labs that are most indicative of congenital heart defects. And similar to the vitals, I use the median laboratory test values on a per patient level as well. So the difference here is that not every patient had, had gone through each laboratory result, which is why I, I imputed the missing lab values with the associated median value. And to check whether the computer was able to adapt to these imputations, I used a binary indicator to flag these imputations. And I'll be presenting my results both with and without the binary flags as well. And finally, I also use the patient's demographic information, like their race and their age. So onto the methodology. The four main models that I will be, I'll be talking about are the, the two baseline ones, are logistic regression and decision tree classifiers. Then the two ensemble ones, which are also decision tree based, are random force and actually used to classifiers. So to get the best versions of these models, I optimize the hyperparameters with the grid search and threefold cross-validation. And the test to train split was 20% going to testing data and 80% going to the training data. And so the performance metrics that I'll be using to evaluate the model's results are accuracy, sensitivity, or the true positive rate, specificity, or the true negative rate, positive predictive value, or precision, negative predictive value, area under the, under the precision recall, and receiver operating characteristic curves, and finally, the F1 score. 
And ultimately, the goal of all this research is to be able to adapt it and use it clinically. So the way that I'm going to be doing this is through a tool of machine learning explainability called the Shapley Added Explanations Shap Feature Importance Plot. And this shows the top 20 most important features that resulted in the model's output, and it also shows the average uh, impact that it had, and it also talks about which class that it used to predict, whether it was readmitted or not readmitted patients. So quickly, here are the results on the cohort. On the left, you can see the p-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, tsne 2 d plot, and this basically characterizes the uh, readmitted and the not readmitted clusters in blue and red, respectively. And so all this basically shows is that there's no clear separation in the clusters. I tried UMAP, PSNE, and PLS, and none of them showed any clear separation. And the table on the right shows uh, the median age, weight, height, length of stay, gender, and uh, race distributions for the readmitted and not readmitted clusters. I also used the rank sums and chi-square statistical tests to generate the p-values on the right column. And all this basically shows that there's no statistically significant differences in these different in these clusters for the two variables. So now on to the results without the binary class. I've done a little bit of color coding on the testing data just to make it easier to visualize. But right off the bat, you can see that the XEBoost classifier had the best uh, accuracy, sensitivity, NPV, AUPRC, AURC, and the F1 score. It also had relatively high specificity and precision. And coming in second is the random forest classifier, which had the highest specificity, precision, and area under the precision recall curve. And this is not surprising, considering that the random forest and, decision, and the action boost classifiers used hundreds of dis different decision trees. So obviously, these were able to adapt to the differences in the data. And the logistic regression and decision tree classifiers performed pretty poorly. So the uh, accuracy of the action boost was 86.6%, and on the random forest, it was 85.1%. So here are the results with the binary class. So looking at it, the difference here is that the random forest classifier outperformed all of the models by a wide margin. Here you can see that the accuracy of the random forest is 89.6% and the extra boost accuracy actually regressed to 83.6%. So what I would like to point you to is the high sensitivity and precision values. The high sensitivity indicates that the model is able to predict most of the readmitted patients and the high precision indicates that the model does so with extremely high accuracy and that's ultimately the goal of this research. So here are the receiver operating characteristics and precision recall curves. So the curve on the left is plots the trade-off between the false positive rate and the true positive rate. And what you can see here is that the area under the curve for the random forest classifier is actually the highest in both curves, which means that it performs the best. And the random and the uh, XE boost classifier is second in the blue line, and that and the uh, logistic regression and decision tree classifiers perform pretty poorly comparatively. So here's the feature important Shapley plot for the random forest model. The y-axis shows the variable name in order of importance, so that just means that it's the top 20 most important uh, features that result in the model's predictions. And the x-axis shows the average shaft value. The gradient color from high to low, and it also has moderate in between, uh, shows the original feature value, where each point also represents a patient from the data set. And so the most important features here were the arterial point of care PCO2, arterial base deficit, pulse rate, central venous pressure, and body temperature. So the reason I've included this graph is that, let's say a, uh, a doctor does not have access to the actual model to plug in the patient's data. If you have this sort of plot, then, if, then the doctor can simply use a patient's data and correlate it to where it falls on the graph, and, it, and, the, and the doctor can be able to determine whether a patient is likely to be readmitted or not readmitted solely off of this graph itself. So there are some next steps that can be taken to improve this research. One of them is to train more complex models like deep neural networks. Uh, the main challenge of this, of this research was that there were a high number of features, uh, 83, and a low number of observations, just 338. So the way you could deal with that is by using deep learning neural networks, which by, like, at, by, training multiple, uh, by, by training multiple layers. And the second way is to embed temporal information into the electronic health records. And what this would do is provide new data every 24 hours to build a decision support system to predict readmissions. 
So right now, I'm taking the median vital and laboratory test values over the patient's entire hospitalization stay. But if you're able to get more accurate, more recent data every single day, then you can produce a discharge readiness score and figure out the likelihood that a patient is going to be uh, that a likelihood that a patient is going to be readmitted. And based off of that, you can determine whether you want to keep the patient in the hospital for an extended period of time. So now I'd like to thank the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta for providing the data set and Dr. Joshua Rosenblum for answering my questions about the Fontaine procedure. Uh, special thanks also go out to my mentors, Professor Rishi Kaysen Kamaleshwaran and PhD student Azali Tabai for helping me throughout this research endeavor. I'd also like to thank the AMIA team for making this conference possible. It's been a great, uh, wonderful learning experience and yeah, thank you all. Questions? So, can you speak to the computational cost of the various models and how that might be something to consider in implementing? Uh, so, the computational cost of the procedure or of the models? Of the models. Oh, so um, the models, um, there was no like co cost for me to run them, but um, it would be difficult to impute a lot of data uh, like in an actual hospital, so they would need to have like fast running servers, if that answers your question. Great. Oops, go ahead. So one of the biggest struggles with any of this uh, types of work is interpretability. And what are your thoughts in terms of getting a, a clinician to trust what's coming out of the other end of your models and how that goes into your choice of a model, even if it may sacrifice your performance a little bit? Yeah, so I definitely think that at the end of the day, like it's very difficult to trust artificial intelligence with everything. So we have to have like a like an actual clinician like using their judgment at the end of the day. But if it is difficult, um, and right now it's like basically like a 50-50 because like 40% of these patients are readmitted and most of them are not like detected. So I think that you should still run the models, like that should definitely be the first step. And then you can have a clinical like a clinician check uh, whether this is accurate. And you could also use the um, the reports like uh, like on where the model makes their mistakes so that you can check uh, like get a better understanding of whether they're going to make an incorrect or correct uh, prediction. Yeah. 